Hello to all of those who have joined us already for the fourth of our California Invasive Species Action Week lunchtime talks. We'll actually get started at 12.05 as the slide indicates. Until then, acquaint yourself with the webinar tools. We have a, a, an audience poll uh, that you can uh, share some of what you know about this topic. And I'll say now, and I'll also uh, repeat when we actually get the call going, that if you need technical help, please put that, or if you wanna share information of some kind, you can do that with the chat. If you have a question for our presenter, please enter that in the Q&A. So we'll get started in just a minute, but in the meantime, Doug, do we have enough responses that we can share the results of the poll? Yeah, let's do it. Let me end it here and share the results. Looks like we fooled uh, a couple of folks. I didn't know that frass was bug poop until just now, but um, bug poop is the right answer. And we care about shot hole borers because they can kill trees. And we'll hear more about that from our speaker today. Very good. And so uh, with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Shannon Lynch currently is a postdoc at UC Davis's Department of Plant Pathology. Uh, Dr. Lynch works extensively in Southern California, uh, studying the invasive shot hole bores and developing a statewide strategic initiative to control and manage uh, the pest disease complex. She received her undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, go Bears. Then uh, that was in 2001, uh, majoring in integrative biology. Uh, she received her PhD in 2020 from UC Santa Cruz, where she studied environmental studies with a designated emphasis in ecology and evolutionary biology. And um, she'll be joining uh, the State University System in New York, um, College of Environmental Science and Forestry as an assistant professor in forest pathology and forest health uh, in the fall of this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon. Thank you, Randall, and thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really um, excited to talk with you all today about invasive shot hole bores. So let me go ahead and get my screen up. And that is visible, Randall? Just Yes, it is. Great. Okay. So yeah, so I'm gonna to talk to you about emerging insights on invasive shot hole bores and some of the work that I've been doing um, for the state in terms of developing a model and looking at all of the microbes that are inside of these trees to find ways to um, uh, basically um, find alternative strategies for control. So a um, little bit of background first. So Fusarium dieback is a pest disease or a pest pathogen complex, and it's caused by these ambrosia beetles that um, the polyvagus shot hole borer and the Corocio shot hole borer, who they form a symbiotic relationship with their own fungal species of fusarium. And the, they're really tiny. So the, these are the beetles here on a penny. The beetle on the left is a male, um, which is much smaller than the female on the right here. And these beetles have these special mandibular structures. So these structures in their mouths and they call my, that are called mycangia. And they use these to basically carry the spores and farm the fungus, which is also a pathogen. And we also know that these beetles carry these other species of fungi with them as well. And they supplement 
their life cycle in some particular way. And that those are some of the things that we're still trying to understand. So the beetles belong to this special group called the Eulacea um, forticata species complex. So this here, this is just a phylogenetic tree. What it's showing is the relationships, how these beetles are related to one another. They're closely related to um, this beetle species called the Tisha Hobor, which is in, um, has been identified in Florida um, and Sri Lanka, but these are all, um, native to Southeast Asia. These are cryptic species, which means that they look so similar that individual species can be mistaken for one another. And so um, although you can, you know, count hairs and identify differences based on just the way their morphology and the way that they look, most of the time we have to confirm their identities using DNA. Um, and they're fu the fusarian species, they all carry their own um, species of fusarium, which are also cl closely related. And this means that basically each beetle has their own fusarium fungus um, that they did not pick up randomly from where they were introduced. So this is a map um, showing locations which various members of the Eulacea fornicata species complex were introduced. Um, Again, they're native to Southeast Asia and were introduced to locations throughout the world. Um, so note here that uh, they were introduced into Israel in 2000, uh, 2000, well, they were detected in 2010, I should say it that way. They're, also, they're also in South Africa, as well as California, and most recently, um, Western Australia. And uniquely, we also, oops, we also have the Carisio Shahobor in California, which has not been detected in these areas, other areas where the, um, this kind of complex has been introduced. So again, they didn't pick up their fungus randomly. They brought them with them from their area of origin. So they have this you know, relationship with these fungi that go back as far as 5 million years. So this isn't just like a one night stand. <laughs> Um, the larvae and adults feed on the fungus, and this is essential because the fungus is the only food source for the beetle, and they're not um, eating anything else. So basically, the way that we think about, you know, their life cycle here, the female beetle attacks a healthy host tree, and that's really important. Unlike most ambrosia beetles um, that like to attack stressed trees, this class, this particular uh, species that we, both of the species we have in California prefer healthy tree. And that's because they need to basically make their galleries or these tunnels. So what they'll do is if we're looking at a cross section of a branch, they bore through the bark into the wood and they make these galleries where they lay their eggs. And then the fungi that they're carrying in their mouth, they inoculate that gallery wall with um, the spores that they're carrying. And so they need the, the um, healthy tissue. They need a tree that's taking up water and nutrients so that the fungus can concentrate those nutrients for the developing larvae and the beetle inside of the tree. So they're not eating the wood, they're eating the fungi. The fungus continues to colonize the wood beyond the gallery wall. This leads to branch um, dieback and sometimes tree mortality. Once the host can no longer support um, fungal growth um, because it's so stressed from beetle attack, it can no longer conduct water. That's when the beetle actually leaves to find a new tree to, um, to attack. So again, um, this is a looking in a little more detail. So here are those galleries in cross section. Um, they colonize the gallery with the fungus. So all that white stuff in there is the fungus. Then it basically spreads through. So all of this dark tissue is 
um, necrosis that's caused by the fungus. And then these holes here, um, if you cut out a little piece and you look more closely, those holes, those are the um, water vessels that are taking up, you know, that are, they're like straws taking water up through the plant. And what happens is the plant basically responds by plugging up those vessels. We call that tyloses. It plugs them up and what it's doing there is it's reacting and trying to prevent the fungus from moving through the plant um, systemically. And this overreaction, you know, if they plug up the vessels too much, that is an overreaction that prevents water from coming up. And that leads to the wilt and dieback that we can see in these trees. So the beetle vector was first detected in California in 2003 in a CDFA funnel trap in Los Angeles, just regular monitoring traps. It wasn't really recognized as a problem until, until 2012 when it was discovered on a backyard avocado tree in Los Angeles. And then the second invasion came late in 2013 in San Diego County, and that was the Corocio shuffle borer. So this is showing just kind of an overall distribution of uh, where these beetles are. We see that basically the Polyvica shuffle borer was first introduced around LA County and or started to really get recognized as a problem in 2012 and spread from there. And then that separate introduction um, in San Diego County by Crocio Shahol Borer. The, um, we have these diamond shapes here are locations where we have traps. We have detected Crocio in traps as far north as San Luis Obispo and on traps and trees in San, Santa Barbara County. And so these jumps that we see are probably because of um, movement of green waste material um, into these new areas. This wouldn't be natural spread. This would be human mediated spread. And so um, the impacts of the beetles can be quite devastating be depending on the conditions in the local site and depending on the host. So just showing you an example of how quickly um, it can spread. This is a cottonwood tree in spring of 2014. And just a few months later, we see this, um, it advanced quite quickly through the tree itself. And then on, you know, kind of a landscape level or at a site, depending on the conditions, it can move really quickly through a site. So I'm just showing you here, this is a Google map overview of a location in the Tijuana River Valley that was taken in April 2015. This strip of green here is a huge area with hundreds of thousands of willow trees in this riparian forest. And um, this is what it looks like a year later, just showing you the worst case scenario, over 200,000 trees were killed, which is indicated by this gray area. And we see these kind of cascading um, effects of the mortality as well. So here, if we're looking at the ground at that same location um, where we see first nice healthy green forest and then um, devastating mortality, Nine months later, we have castor bean, which is a highly invasive weedy plant that's begun to encroach into the area, preventing establishment and recovery of native willow trees. And these trees serve as critical breeding habitat for endangered bird species. So this little tiny beetle can really have a huge impact across a lot of different scales. And so very early on, we observed a whole range of symptoms on a variety of tree species. And this is just kind of giving you a little um, palette of what some of those symptoms look like. And we also observed a lot of variation in the severity of the impact where some hosts show just a uh, branch dieback and others are actually killed when they are attacked. And so in order to understand, you know, this variation across different species, we dug into the biology a little bit more. And we found that when a beetle tries to attack a tree, it could not establish a gallery and successfully colonize on some of those species. 
While for others, the beetle couldn't establish a gallery, but the pathogen could colonize on the tree. And then on other species, a beetle could bore into the trunk, produce a gallery, establish a fungal garden, that's what we see here in the white, and then make a brood. So we have a little family of beetles in these galleries and then spread to a new host. So both the beetle and the fungus must be able to reproduce on a host in order for to what we call to be competent. So it's, or you might hear reproductive host. And each of those steps have the potential to differ among susceptibility in species. And these species are also distributed across major kinds of systems. So, um, in native plant communities, urban forests, as well as the avocado growing region throughout the state, um, which produces 90% of the US domestic crop. So um, this leaves a lot of stakeholders concern and we wanted to know what was going on with the host range to understand spread and impact. And so fortuitously, some of the most heavily infested areas in the very early stages of the infestation in Southern California are home to two of its biggest botanical gardens. And because they harbor a wide range of plant species that represent unique and common ecosystems from all over the world, um, including those that are native to California and also planted in California, we have this rare opportunity to use these gardens as a natural laboratory to investigate the plant host range of this beetle fungus complex. And what we found was that these host types are based on, um, they're kind of nested into one another. Um, and it's this nested interactions between host plants and the beetles and the fungal pathogens where um, the beetle makes that attempted attack on 324 species, 137, on which only um, the fungus can colonize. And then a subset of 77 species are those competent hosts that support reproduction of the fungus and the beetle and are important in the spread, including um, 20 species that are native to California, avocado, and anywhere from 25 to 60% of all individuals that are planted across the urban landscape in Southern California. And then a subset of 18 species can be killed when they are attacked. So that lethality of different hosts is important in terms of the ecological impact. And uh, we also want to know if these subsets are arbitrary or if there's some predictability in which tree species are attacked and colonized and competent or killed. And one of the ways that this can be predictable and what we found is that there is an evolutionary basis for, you know, for these kind of interactions. And so, you know, we know intuitively that closely related species are more similar to each other in their traits or characteristics than distant relatives. So um, for one, like just as a simple example, um, all oaks all oak trees, they make acorns, for example. And so for disease, those host traits may be pathogen defense. And that similarity between close relatives is what we call a phylogenetic signal. And that just simply means that closely related plants are more likely to share pests and pathogens. And the way that we quantify this is by calculating what we call a phylogenetic distance between the species or groups. So this is a this is a what we call a phylogenetic tree of different kinds of species. And for example, um, the distances between um, for the trees within this orange group are shorter. Um, basically between within the orange and within the blue group, those distances are shorter. So they are more likely to share the same kinds of pathogens with within their groups because those trees are more similar in their traits. And then the distances between the blue and the orange groups are longer, so they are less likely to share pathogens because they are less similar in their traits. And this is gonna be important um, for um, being able to predict its establishment. 
Um, and so, you know, this complex is, you know, encountering a whole new set of possible hosts um, and how it's going to behave is important to understand to be able to respond appropriately. So it's showing up in these new places, encountering all these new species they don't have any evolutionary or ecological history with. And so the outcomes of these interactions are unknown. Um, and so again, um, these are we um, these are things I already kind of discussed, but we are working with our colleagues in Israel and South Africa, as well as Western Australia most currently to be able to um, prioritize which tree species to monitor so um, they can try and get ahead of the game um, and stop the bleeding as early as possible. And we want to basically create this tool um, so that land managers who have limited resources, um, but they need to start somewhere can stay ahead of that problem. Okay, so how are we predicting establishment in California? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we developed the model. And um, basically, um, typically, so when we want to predict the presence of pests, we look at you know, these climate envelopes and locations with optimal climate conditions that you know, those with those optimal conditions are gonna be greater risk for pest establishment. But because um, invasive shahal borers and fusarium dieback hosts are distributed over this complex landscape where some sites have one species like an avocado grove and other sites have a lot of species like these natural forests, we wanted to use our evolutionary understanding of host relationships to be able to predict um, which locations the beetle and the pathogen is most likely to establish and cause damage in California. And again, there's good reason to do this in California, given that um, the beetles have been detected in monitoring traps, you know, 250 kilometers north of the leading edge of the infestation. So, um, so this is important stuff. <laughs> And so what we did to be able to do this was we established this large plot network in infested and non-infested locations in these, you know, um, peri-urban and wildland forests as well as avocado groves. And we did this to basically incorporate the whole range of environmental conditions over which the beetle and the fungus could thrive. We collected microclimate data in each of these plots as well and measured the amount of disease if present on each of these tree species. And so these plots are distributed all the way from San Diego County um, um, in the south to Ventura County up in the north. And um, we had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> there were a lot of rattlesnakes involved as well. So and yellow jackets. <laughs> um, but just so just briefly, I'm um, just to kind of give you a conceptual idea of how we did this. We basically estimated site susceptibility um, based on this interaction between phylogenetic structure. So those host relationships, as well as abundance. And so if you can see this is um, this is one plot. These are the species that are in that plot. And what we did was we calculated for each of these species, the probability that they are a, um, a host using um, the phylogenetic distances between them and other confirmed hosts. So this thing here that looks kind of like a death star is a larger phylogenetic tree of all of the um, species that, all of the woody species that the beetles could encounter in California. And we weighted those, that probability by how abundant each species were. And then you can add those up and get an estimate of site susceptibility. And what we found is that we had this looking at, we did um, this logistic regression. So we have the um, probability that a site is infested and our observed plots 
here, observed infestation on the y-axis, and that estimate of um, site susceptibility on the x-axis. And basically, we found this highly significant effect in which the probability that a site is infested does increase with this increasingly you know, phylogenetically weighted host abundance. So more species that are closely related to one another in a local site, that site is going to be more likely to serve as a place of establishment for the beetle. Um, we also know from previous work that beetles produce more generations per year with warmer conditions. And so temperature is an important constraint on beetle development. And because we have temperature measurements in all of our plots, we were able to estimate the number of beetle generations per year for each site using basically what we call a degree day model. And um, these parameters that were done in previous experimental work um, by uh, Richard Stouthammer and Tim Payne at UC Riverside. And so basically what we, it, what the idea is that if we look at the optimal range for beetle development, a site that has temperature falling within that optimal range more option, more often is more likely to be infested in contrast to this non-infested site here. So um, basically we took this, we, we, we took the degree day information and we took this host species composition, this phylogenetically informed predictive model um, that is actually a powerful way to assess risk and guide response priorities to see if we could make predictions across the state. And so we applied this model that was validated from the plot monitoring research data to assess fusarium dieback, shot, invasive shot hole bore site susceptibility throughout cities in California. Um, so this is based on actual tree data. Each of these grids here are where we have complete inventories of trees. Um, and this is at the one kilometer scale. And we basically were able to um, apply that model to 170 cities within California that have those complete inventories. Um, that ended up being a, many thousands of grids. We um, compiled data for over 5 million trees in 1,000 species total. And so this is just kind of showing an overview, a, an example in Orange County of what that would look like. This is for the urban forest again. Um, and basically what we got is this map um, across the state, again, where we have complete inventories of cities. So you have these, basically these clusters, obviously it's not the whole picture, but what these clusters represent are areas where um, the beetle could potentially um, establish and areas from which the beetle could potentially spread. And so we have, um, the WPS, so that is that estimate of site susceptibility just based on species composition. And the lighter yellow, is they're going to be less susceptible. Dark red, they're going to be more susceptible. And so if we just kind of zoom in here on Orange County, this is what that would look like. So you have these hot grids and, you know, these fairly cool grids. And basically, the idea is that we want people to be able to use this to say, okay, where do we want to maybe put traps or where do we want to monitor? Where is it going to be best to apply different management strategies? Um, and then if we look up into Sacramento County, where the um, we do not have invasive shot hole borer, it's interesting. So you can see that there are some hot spots, um, a lot of hot spots for um, potential establishment. So basically what this is saying is, is if there is movement of green waste from an infested area all the way up into Northern California, this is suggesting that the beetle could definitely establish there and spread from there, kind of like what we're seeing in those jumps already in Southern California. Um, and then just another kind of picture of the Bay Area as well. So because we don't have the complete tree inventories to fill in the whole state, 
we created this additional map. Um, and like our plots, we estimated the number of beetle generations at the kilometer scale. So we were able to get, so this is like all of the grids for temperature now. And we were um, basically able to download a bunch of um, daily minimum and maximum temperature data um, for each calendar year from this data repository. Estimate the number of beetle generations. So you can kind of see, you know, where this can fill in and how these things can be used in conjunction with one another. Um, and that's what this map looks like here. So um, just a couple of things, basically. So the dark blue is where you can have a lot of beetles. And then this kind of light blue is where um, an area that wouldn't support that many beetle generations. And so basically, what we can see here is the Central Valley um, is kind of in this upper range here. So you have this potential, you know, if the climate is good for the beetle, and then we look at the host composition um, at those local sites, then um, we can get a sense that the beetle could move um, and establish, establish and move through um, the Central Valley pretty, pretty easily. Um, Palm Springs is down here. It's very hot. Not a lot of um, great hosts there, but um, again, just, you know, kind of giving you a picture. So this is what Orange County looks like. Um, here is Sacramento County again. And I have, let me show like this, there we go. Um, so this is kind of, you know, how we're hoping that people can use the maps to guide priorities. Bay Area, temperature constraints on the beetle um, is pretty high. So, you know, it looks like the Bay Area could produce less beetles, but you have a lot of, you know, you have areas with a lot of good hosts. So that host composition is really the most um, important factor, what we found. And then that um, temperature piece is kind of that additive effect. And so the way that we like to think about it is that, I'll just put this here, is to think about using the temperature data like as a broad brush, um, you know, assessment of risk throughout the state. You know, where is it going to be good for the beetle? Um, and then kind of hone in on those areas for um, where uh, we're looking at uh, species composition. Okay, so we hope that the tool will be helpful for basically identifying locations where control treatments will be most effective, um, help reduce environmental impacts of systemic pesticides um, by targeting their use, and then also determining appropriate locations and tree species for which these you know, costly tree removal measures would be best implemented. Oops, they got on there first. So um, some of the ongoing research is, that we're doing right now is we're integrating landscape considerations into this model for these statewide predictions. And we're also integrating um, this epidemiology um, work into statewide economic models so that, um, so that um, managers can really look at the costs and benefits of doing particular actions in different locations based on um, risk of spread in establishment. And so I'm just going to go quickly here through um, the talking to you about um, some other things that we're looking at in addition to just trying to forecast um, uh, pest establishment. And that is looking at the host microbiome, um, which is known to play a role in protecting plants against pathogens and herbivores. So these communities can actually be an important indicator for forest health. And so then understanding how these microbial communities are organized and how they behave can help us better understand how disease works in these systems. And so when we're talking about endophytes, what we're talking about are fungi and bacteria that live inside of the plant tissues. So the microbiome is these organisms everywhere, the endophytes are inside of the tissues. 
and they can be affecting variation in disease outcomes. So for example, these are two pictures of planted sycamores. They were taken in the same location in a disease hotspot in March, November. And the trees in the yellow area it, the, with the yellow arrows, they were infested, but they got better. The trees with the orange arrows were infested and got worse. And then some never got infested, um, you know, as indicated by the white arrow. And this of course can be simply, they're susceptible, but they're just not yet infested. But because these trees are planted, they're planted trees and they have similar genetic makeup, we're thinking that another possibility for this variation is the endophytic communities in these non-infested trees. Um, and those might be contributing to whether or not a tree is susceptible or recovering and preventing infection. And so we studied the endophytic microbiome in these trees and collected wood from, um, from these different tree samples and, um, or from different tree species. And we looked at what the fungi and bacteria look like in those woods. So the, these different plates are culture plates from different trees that we sampled. And you can see that there's differences in the numbers and the kinds of species that are in each of those. And so we sampled a lot of trees in a subset of that, of those monitoring plots that we looked at. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You're not going to be tested on this, but just to show you, we have a huge range of diversity of fungi as well as uh, bacteria that we recovered from um, the wood in these trees. And we did this analysis of everything that we cultured to see if the endophyte communities differed among host species. And so the first thing that we see is that um, there's this strong separation. So the dots that are like closer together are gonna be more similar and the dots that are further away are gonna be more different. And so, yeah, so we see there's this strong separation between avocado and the black and then these wild species suggesting that there's um, my, the microbial community differences between them. And we also see some differences among the wildland species as well, which is illustrated in this other axis. And then when we look further into those host species, we found this really interesting pattern where the microbial communities in the non-diseased tree individuals in the black had different compositions than their neighbors had um, been when they were attacked. Um, so, this raises some intriguing results. And one of the things that we're working on is validating this through a richer data set using um, genetic information. Um, but the questions that we have are, you know, once the trees are attacked, are their microbiomes changing? Or are there, you know, pre-existing differences in the microbiomes of these trees to protect them or make them even more susceptible? Um, but the main takeaway here is that it raises the possibility that there are some microbes in trees that are actively protecting them from attack by fusarium, um, which is important. Um, so we tested um, 60 fungal and 40 bacterial species for inhibition of the fusarium pathogen in a culture experiment. And so basically these are Petri plates where we're growing these microbes. And on some of them, we grow only the fungus and on others, we grow the fungus with these different endophytes that we got from the wood. And uh, what we found here is that some of these endophytes create this, what we see in the red arrows here, this zone of inhibition. So there is some antibiotic properties in these, in these um, microbes that are diffusing through the media and preventing the fungus from growing to the edge of the plate. In contrast to say, for example, this endophyte here in the blue arrow, which couldn't prevent the fungus from advancing to the edge of the plate. Um, but in addition to that antibiotic inhibition, we saw a range of interactions between the fungi and the pathogen, including so that antibiotic inhibition, competition, um, as well as coexistence. So we now know the behavior of some of these species 
And that's going to help inform our analysis of this richer sequencing data set that we're working on right now. But taking this one step further, what we did was we took some of, you know, any of the bacteria um, that exhibited antibiotic inhibition in those plates, and we inoculated them into avocado and sycamore seedlings. We allowed them to establish there. Um, and then once they were established, we inoculated them with the fusarium pathogen to see if they could colonize the seedlings. And three months later, we tried to re-isolate the fusarium from the woody tissue. And what this graph is showing is the proportion of trees that we re-isolated fusarium from those seedlings. And basically what this gives us is an indication that when the seedlings were co-inoculated with these bacterial endophytes and fusarium, they inhibited the establishment of the pathogen. And so this is really important because remember the beetles can only survive if they are eating the fungus. Um, and the fungus itself is a pathogen. So if the microbial communities interfere with the fungal growth, then it protects the individual plant and reduces the spread of disease. And so um, we are working right now, um, as far as applications are concerned in where we see this having the most immediate you know, application is in restoration settings where you can manage the microbiomes of organisms before they're planted out into the wild. And so we're working on various techniques to um, introduce those endophytes on a mass scale and testing to see you know, how long they persist in those, um, in those plants and um, all, you know, all sorts of different experiments to see if we can potentially basically introduce them um, as a management and use them as a management option. And so we're also just looking at changes in microbiomes over time, again, just to test to see if there's any, um, you know, can the, the microbes establish, but then if we have changes in weather conditions and things like that, do they go dormant? Um, do we get different species coming up at different times of the year? And so we're looking at that as well over time. Um, so I just wanted to give a big thanks to the Invasive Species Council of California um, and all of our funding sources as well that's kind of come together to create this body of work. And I am happy to take I'll leave this up for you um, and happy to take any questions. Hey, Shannon, thanks for the great talk. Um, yeah, we've got some questions for you. Okay. The first one is from Terry um, and they wanna know, how do we keep um, these out of our trees in Ventura? Great, yeah, great question. So there are, a, if you go to the, um, the ishb.org website, there are some resources there that you can look at on um, some of the different options. It really depends on, um, it really depends on the conditions, the value of the tree, the um, tree species, where it is, all of these things like matter. So what we did was um, we developed a management matrix that tells that, you know, based on different criteria of like the trees that you're interested in, it will give you some suggestions on how to manage it. The, I think the one of the big things that we're, we, um, we are, kind of trying to accept is that, you know, we can't completely get rid of the beetle at this point, but we can manage it. And so there are different, you know, sanitation practices, you know, pruning. Um, there are some pesticide treatments that can work under certain um, constraints and in certain contexts. 
And that's why we're working so hard on the end of fights as well um, to be able to provide alternatives. Yeah, and um, I think we also want to um, acknowledge that this particular pest is in Ventura County. And, yeah, and, uh, yes. They're yeah. actively monitoring it and uh, working to uh, remove infested trees. Yeah. Shannon, can you repeat the, um, the, the website where people can get information and I'll put it in the chat? Absolutely, ishb.org. And if you if you can see my screen, so I have the website up. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. The one. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. All right. And next question sort of goes hand in hand with that one. Um, have you or other colleagues considered collaborating with tribes to perform cultural burnings um, to help eliminate the pest? Yeah. Sure. Um, that that's such a great question and so we are working with some tribes in um, Sequan um, and working on their property there to just kind of monitor the beetle and everything there hasn't been um, a lot of discussion about any you know fire practices or anything like that um, and that's that is definitely something worth having a conversation over and you know thinking about how um how that can be applied um yeah all right and the next up we have a couple of questions concerning green waste um from earl um he wants to know green waste as a movement vector why is it being moved is it a composting resource so, you know, I, you know, it's, it's various reasons. So basically the, you know, tree gets chopped down. They don't know it has shot hole bore in it and it gets moved um, to a green waste facility. And by accident, then the green waste facility has beetles in that wood where, you know, once you cut down a fresh tree um, with beetles, that is the time where, the beetles are going to actively try to get out of there and find a new tree to attack um, because they can't survive in the dead wood or the cut wood. So, um, so you know, a lot of it is just you know it's accidental. And then I guess a follow up to that, Andrea wants to know: Are there quarantine zones set up for green waste movement? There are not, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else wants, if um, Julie wants to speak to that at all, or Randall. Um, the, the quarantine is difficult. It, it kind of similar with, um, it's, a, it's a similar um, problem with um, gold spot oak borer as well as trying to kind of um, limit um, the movement of firewood throughout the state. There's a lot of challenges associated with um, trying to implement a quarantine. Um, but yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, that's not something that we have right now. Were you going to say something, Randall? I, I was just going to add that um, we're concerned about the green waste, we're also concerned about movement of firewood, yeah. um, which which those two things are a primary way that uh, various types of uh, wood wood boring or, or tree dwelling insects are spread, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the regulation around those things is uh, extremely expensive and um, tough to get regulations passed. So I, I'll add to that. I, at this point, because it's not a regulated situation, that we're spending a lot of our efforts educating people how to best treat uh, infested wood when it's been downed and also movement of firewood for barbecues, camping, personal heating use. And, and so our offices with uh, UC um, Cooperative Extension have, uh, have a, a, a good 
outreach program and all the materials we use can be found on the website that Dr. Lynch referenced. Thank you yeah, everyone for the answer there. Um, Thank you. Ne next up is a question from Alisa. You mentioned that the ISBH attack and reproduce in healthy trees, but are they also able to reproduce in deadwood? They are not. Um, again, be again. So they need um, they need that healthy wood tissue in order for the fungus to be able to grow um, and actively concentrate nutrients for the developing larvae. So, um, so that's a good thing. They can't reproduce in deadwood. <laughs> All right, and then um, Tracy is up. Um, what is the normal infective pathway of the endophytic fun fungi? Seed infection, wound, root? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are different ways that the endophytes can reproduce inside a tree. So it can be, um, what we call vertical transmission. So basically from the, from the plant into the seed and then into the next generation. And then there can be horizontal transmission. And so that is anywhere from, you know, basically, um, you know, through some kind of, you know, opening in the plant tissue, um, you know, from individual to individual kind of a thing. Um, we, you know, like, like I showed you, there's, you know, a whole range, uh, we have hundreds of different species of endophytes that we identified and they're all different and they all have different life history traits. And so the idea is that at least from a restoration perspective, we really want to be able to, um, just be able to introduce them and get them established in the tree and hope that they persist for, you know, the lifetime. Um, at this point, we're not actively looking at whether it can like go to the next generation since these trees are so long lived. All right. And then um, Terry wants to know, how did you sample the microbiome, direct sequencing or culturing them? Yeah, Terry, that's such a good question. We did, so we did both because there is, um, so I didn't go into um, all of the details there, but there is, there is sampling bias in both approaches using, um, using sequencing and using culturing techniques. So um, basically what we did was we took, we sampled the wood and then we extracted the um, DNA from the wood on all of the samples that we collected. So we have um, 1200 samples that we collected. We extracted DNA from those. And what we're doing is um, what's called meta barcoding. So we're using um, high throughput sequencing analysis to identify community members. Um, that is sitting in a lab at UC Berkeley right now. <laughs> and we're waiting for that. So the things that I did report was the cultural data. And um, on a subset of those, uh, of those wood samples, um, on a representative sample, then we cultured the wood as well. And there's a, there's a benefit to doing that, even though you're not, there, there, are, my, there are endophytes that you just can't culture. And so we're hoping that, you know, that um, you know, the sequencing data set will give us insight into like all of the things that are there, but the things that you can grow, um, is useful because you can identify at least how things are behaving more or less. It's not perfect. Um, you know, a culture media is very different from like what they're actually doing in the wood, but it gives you an indication of, um, how things might be competing or coexisting and that sort of a thing. Um, and it helps us identify mechanisms about the kinds of patterns that we're seeing. Um, 
the, the molecular work, it can give you patterns, but it won't give you any like explanation of process of what, you know, how these things are behaving. So the two really complement one another. All right, and I know it's getting close to noon. Um, we have about five more questions if you have time to answer them. Uh, yes, Andrea, um, I do. I can, um, if, if you wanna email me, uh, the question is, do you have a picture or map of how San Diego looks? Um, email me, I'll, I'll, um, I can send that to you. Uh, known examples of non-reproductive host trees dying from fusarium. There are not. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So, um, no. <laughs> Is there concern about fresh arborist wood chips being used as mulch? Um, yeah, great question. It's my understanding insects are killed in the chipping process. So, um, if you chip your wood material to a size that's less than um, than an inch that kills 99% of the beetles. So um, then, if you if you solarize that chip material, that you know guarantees that you've killed everything in there. So um, if you want to use it as mulch make sure that you chip and kill everything. If you're in an area that's like really heavily infested, chip it as small as you can, um, kill, every, kill as much as you can and don't move the chipping material. And yeah, last questions, any injections of endophyte into adult big trees? Uh, that is something that we are working on right now. All right, yeah, thank you for your time, Shannon. Yeah, thank you everyone. Let me stop share. This has been a wonderful presentation, Dr. Lynch. We really appreciate you uh, coming and giving this talk and answering all these questions. So uh, we are at the uh, scheduled time for this meeting to end and we want to be considerate of everyone's time. So thank you all for joining this conversation. Um, Shen, you'll be around for a few minutes if somebody else wants sure. to add a question or two. Of course. Okay. So if anybody else has any further questions, uh, please do feel the, free to put those in the Q&A and uh, we can address those. And again, thank you all for coming and uh, we hope you uh, will also join us tomorrow for the uh, final of these lunchtime talks. Thanks, everyone. And I'm not seeing any anybody posting additional questions, neither yeah. the chat or the Q&A. So once again, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.